Welcome to another episode of our podcast show uh, here at Access to Perspectives. And welcome warmly, Susanna Maratha and Anna Pico um from Switzerland. And yeah, it's a pleasure having you here. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. And so just to contextualize, we we didn't actually meet the summer, but um, I or like two of us were presenting at the Swiss Open Science Summer School this year. And I think I've also um, seen you on the program of the previous summer school two years ago, mm -hmm. um, where um, you presented amongst um, legal issues, legal challenges for researchers, which we'll talk about today as well. And then you developed the DM law tool, which we'll come to talk about later on. So stay tuned, listeners. This is something that's really come in handy for your research and will make your life very much easier um, when it comes to legal considerations about your research, um, which was really confusing and frightening actually also for me when I was a grad student. But um, yeah, starting, starting off, how about, um, would, you, would you like sharing about your, yourselves, where you work and um, what brought you to work on legal, legal aspects of research? Um, would you like to start, uh, Anna, maybe? Yes, so thank you very much for inv inviting us to this uh, podcast. We're ha very happy to be here. It's like the first time we do something like this. So uh, we hope to be, to be clear. So maybe, um, yeah, just a few words about myself. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Faculty of Communication culture and society uh, of the Università della Svizzera Italiana. This is the university of the Italian speaking part uh, in Switzerland. And um, among others, I'm teaching two courses, one related to e-government and the other uh, about online communication design. And on the other side, I'm also working as a scientific collaborator for uh, our university's e-learning lab. And there I'm in charge of the Competence Center in Digital Law, which we will maybe introduce uh, later on a little bit uh, more in depth. Mm. Um, yeah, what else? I'm also um, part of the operating unit of uh, the Lugano Living Lab, which is a, a lab for integrating technologies and favoring innovation uh, provided by uh, our city in collaboration with the with the university and um, yeah I have I'm, I'm actually uh, originally uh, coming from the German speaking part of Switzerland I grew up in Zurich and Zug and then moved to the to Ticino the Italian speaking part in order to study communication sciences and then I stayed here I worked for several years for a steel trading company in this always in the field of um, IT I was responsible for the intranet and then I moved back to the university to do a PhD my PhD was about um, studying social dimensions of public large-scale wi-fi networks uh, I analyzed the case of a municipal and of a community wireless network and then while uh, working at our university, we work on many different projects. Um, uh, yeah, one project was about building up this uh, competence center in, in digital law within the e-learning lab. But I think we can say a little bit more about this later on. Um, what else to say? I now I have been living here in Lugano since, since then. Um, I have three kids, two boys and the daughter, the boys are 14 and 16, and the daughter is nine, nine years old. And they keep me busy quite a lot <laughs> beyond my job. <laughs> and um, yes, I don't know, do you want some, some more information? <laughs> That's great for now. And I'm sure we'll hear more um, about your work. And um, yeah, maybe, maybe if you would add like what made you interest, what, what sparked your interest in legal aspects and research, like how, because like myself and others I know, we were just 
scared to not to death but like quite intimidated by anything legal when it comes to yeah. um consider that or it's like it seems so far away from what we want to engage in <laughs> as researchers but what yeah. Yes, so I mean, I, I didn't actually plan to do anything about legal aspects when I started here. It was thanks to a project we had with within uh, with Swiss universities, uh, which was about making this uh, legal aspect mainly about copyright um, more accessible to uh, let's say a, a non-expert audience. No, so this mm -hmm. challenge of providing training and also a little bit of advising but in a language that is mm -hmm. so that it can help be helpful to people who uh, haven't studied law uh, before and i think this challenge of actually translating this sometimes very complex uh, language um, actually fascinated me and uh, also this idea of like my idea of law was is like this is something very strict very fixed and uh, everything is very well defined while i actually had to discover that uh, yeah okay there are some rules but then on how to apply this really depends a lot on the case it really depends on the context so one of the most uh, used answers by by legal expert and also by us now is like oh it, it depends no and which is sometimes frustrating oh, for the people yeah. because they want clear answers uh -huh. and for us in order to be able to provide clear answers we need clear cases no so the, mm -hmm. the more specific people are the more specific we can be with the answers obviously beyond providing the, the gen general concepts which Susanna will will talk about uh, mm -hmm. later on but um, yeah so it's it's actually very fascinating uh, area i would say and especially also our goal was applying this this legal um, rules to the digital context so in, mm. in in this in the world of internet of where pictures are available so easily and people are not always aware of what can actually be done with this huge amount of material that is mm. just one click away on, on and available on the, on the internet now yeah and it's also like I think a common misconception is that um, anything legal is restrictive and it is in a way but it's also to protect and to ensure um, authorship acknowledgement of the creator of any image or text or data but we come to talk about that like what's the reasoning behind legal requirements is is it yeah it's it's fascinating also to me like i recently learned also on the podcast about patents like i had a totally different view on patents um them being super restrictive and, and enabling monopolies where the idea of patents in the first place was actually to protect and also share the knowledge yeah. um but protect from misappropriation and misuse i um, think this is really something also like researchers are in this double role no so mm. on the one side they are authors they're producing knowledge they're writing articles and on the other side they would like to reuse content that already exists so they yeah. are in this yeah once on the one side they're users and on the other side they're authors and i think that's also what helps them up to a certain part understand also the value of the of the rules for yeah. on the one side protecting and on the other side favoring uh, reuse of, of material yeah thank you so much anna and susanna please um let us know who you are and um what brought you to to work with anna on legal aspects yeah so um also from my side thank you very much joe for inviting us um so i'm where to start first of all i'm uh, i've been working for the company center in digital law um always already presented by anna uh, so I've been working for uh, three years now and dealing with uh, the issues that occur in a digital in the digital world, so to say. The two main issues are uh, copyright and data protection um, matters, which are distinct one from the other. They are independent one from the other. Um, but these are the two main law field that must be considered when uh, or in academia, in research, uh, especially. So um, I'm finishing my law studies, actually. I'm writing now my thesis, 
Um, I'm studying law in Como, which is North Italy. It's uh, close to the border with Switzerland. That's why uh, we study both Swiss and Italian law, which is very interesting because it, it gives um, a very open-minded perspective of law because even if Swiss law and Italian law are similar, but they are also in the same, um, they're also very different one from the other and the mm -hmm. mentalities are very different. So it's very interesting to be able to compare two different um, laws, two different legislations. And so I'm, I'm finishing um, soon, hopefully, finally. Mm -hmm. And my thesis is about, actually, is about uh, giving an interpretation of, or finding a solution to permit open access in, um, in the sharing of uh, cultural goods. Mm -hmm. So the goal is to um, cultural heritage preservation and sharing of this knowledge uh, where copyright very often gives a closed um, mm -hmm. permission, is very restrictive. There is this, as you said, this monopoly, this exclusive right of the right holder. Uh, and it's very difficult to, to share works protected by copyright. Um, so there are different uh, conflict, different interests in conflict. On one side, uh, intellectual property is part of the property right uh, guaranteed by the constitution, as well as by guaranteed by many international higher acts. Uh, but the same level, uh, there are also other interests such as freedom of expression, freedom of research, freedom of education, the need for a society to develop uh, culture, to be part of culture, to develop knowledge. Um, so we need to find, we, I mean, we need, to, the, the copyright law needs to find a balance between these different interests. And so um, starting working in this competence center in digital law here at the university, Università della Svizzera Italiana in Lugano, I started being really passionate about this topic, uh, especially about copyright. Um, and so I started really being interested in this whole field. So apart from working here, also I, I also deal in this topic for my private interest. I'm part of, I, I also collaborate with Creative Commons in several policies and creating several policies in order to find a solution to be active uh, worldwide, to open up mm, copyright. That doesn't mean um, deleting all the rights of the right holder, but it's about giving a power, more powerful mm, space to uh, freedom of expression and uh, preservation of cultural heritage. Um, well, we'll talk about that maybe later on. I don't want to now yeah. tell everything. <laughs> but so, so to say, started uh, starting by working for this competence center, I started being really passionate about copyright. So that mm, brought me to be, to work in this field also uh, beyond what is work, but also uh, doing, being part of Creative Commons and finding other possibilities and solutions to um, to open up copyright. Mm. Apart from uh, the Competence Center in Digital Law, I also work for the regional administration um, but that has nothing to do with copyright. So it's another field uh, dealing with more criminal law. And yeah, well, that's, that's it. Two huge areas of work you're engaged in. Yes, yes. <laughs> But, <laughs> Maybe too yeah. much, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, no, um, yeah, uh, there was more an, an, an intonation of appreciation and um, amazement rather than crit criticizing. <laughs> um, no, 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 okay. <laughs> thank you. Um, right, and super interesting. Thanks so much. So um, we talked in, uh, before um, this recording now, we, we agreed that we divide the conversation into two parts, starting with data protection, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah. So 
Um, so yeah, when it comes to data protection, research data, what is research data in the first place? And maybe we would also have to define that and the different components of data, like metadata, primary data, secondary, raw data, some, some listeners might be well aware, or maybe we don't have to make these distinctions talking about data protection. Um, but in your work at the Competence Center, and also as you facilitate or inform researchers how they can or should protect the data, um, data sets that they, um, decide to publish and share, but also maybe at what point does data protection come into play? play? Um, is it already necessary at the working level when you're still processing the data, or is it only up on the decision point where you actually want to release it to a wider audience? And does that audience have to be public, or is data protection already a requirement or a necessity to have? Um, at earlier stages when you share with a um, selected audience um, and not the general public online. Um, so where should we start? What would you, you're the experts, like where should we dig in and how, like I leave it totally up to you how to frame the topic. <laughs> Uh, maybe just uh, one thing maybe as, uh, that could be uh, useful for the for the audience maybe if we quickly introduce also what the what our competence center actually is mm -hmm. and uh, uh, just just to frame a little bit why yeah. actually we are here to to talk about this, uh, this yes topic, absolutely now no, let's start and, there uh, and then maybe we have like we probably... and then we can move to the to the data protection if, if this is okay for you absolutely yeah perfect okay okay so just a few words now so um yeah, we call it it's ccdigitallaw.ch. It's the competence center in digital law. And the goal of this competence center is actually to support Swiss higher education institutions um, in dealing with legal questions, mainly in relation to um, new media, digital media, the digitalization projects and technologies and to raise uh, awareness of legal risks. Mm. So what we are providing is mainly um, um, teaching, is uh, training and some advices to all kind of people who are working within Swiss higher education institutions. This could be researchers, teachers, uh, all kind of administrative stuff. Uh, a lot of libraries actually uh, come to us, but sometimes also IT services. And in some cases, we also collaborate with, uh, with the legal services of the, of the universities. Um, so how did we come to create this center? So it has been created through a project funded by the program Scientific Information Access, Treatment and Safeguarding by Swiss universities already quite some years ago. And it is the result of a collaboration between different universities. So uh, our university, the Università della Svizzera Italiana, the University of Basel, the University of Neuchâtel, the University of Geneva, and also the Conference uh, of Swiss Libraries. Um, the main challenge, I would say, for this center uh, has actually been trying to uh, find a sustainable business model. Uh, we actually at the beginning wanted to have a collaboration between these universities to continue the project also um, after the end of the, of the funded projects by Swiss universities. Um, this uh, actually uh, resulted very difficult. So that's why our university and specifically our uh, e-learning um, section of our university decided to take over the, the work that we have done, especially also the platform. We have created a, a platform with a huge knowledge base about uh, copyright aspects where really we try to explain the different rules, the, the different laws in a in a more simple, in a more understandable language, providing uh, a lot of examples. We have a, a, a vast uh, FAQ section. And so to maintain this, uh, this platform and also to, to, to maintain and, and extend the service uh, of training and uh, of advising. And I have to say, now, uh, after several years of operations, we actually receive quite a lot of requests for, especially for trainings and also for um, 
for advising. Mm. And maybe the last thing to say about this, that is we are always operating before a legal problem occurs. We try to, to, to do this awareness uh, raising. As soon as um, someone has a legal problem, we say, no, you have to go to a lawyer and we are not, that's not our, uh, our expertise. So yeah. our expertise is, is before. We, we try to avoid uh, legal problems uh, appearing and, and, and the, the coming up. Yeah. So mm -hmm. this in, in a few words, I don't know if it was clear enough or if it you have other questions much. about it. Absolutely. And we also have like um, the link to the Competence Center is also in the show notes and the related blog post to this episode. So um, listeners, please um, take a visit to the website of ccdigitallaw.ch and you'll find a vast amount of information which is tailored towards a Swiss research audience, but much of the information we come to talk about is probably also applicable in other countries um and what's the only thing that i think we'll also talk about like what how does copyright differ in various countries and what aspects of, of the copyright is universal but universal doesn't necessarily include every country on this planet right yeah, I think this is something that Susanna will explain uh, later on. And I think that this is a very important point to raise up now. So uh, our knowledge base, all the information we provide through our pl platform is based on the Swiss law. Mm -hmm. And as you said, there are many aspects that are similar in other countries, but obviously not everything. So yeah, be aware of the fact that... Uh, mm -hmm. We yeah, the basis is the Swiss legislation. Yeah, and the DM law that we're going to present later on as well um, as a tool for researchers to look at and to inform and get a quick overview, but also in-depth um, insight around various legal aspects it is also based on the Swiss um, legal requirements and consistencies. Um, and you also have a disclaimer for any visitor, like please make sure that you also consider your national and international legal requirements. Cool. So that's sorted. <laughs> um, thanks very much, Anna, for yeah, contextualizing and also like for, yeah, thanks for both of your work and your colleagues um, in the Competence Center. I think this is highly needed um, for any stakeholder of research um, to, yeah, to get, have easy access to an understanding of legal requirements and legal, um, the baseline to conduct our work under. And it's actually not so difficult, I figured. Like, it sounds intimidating thinking about legal stuff, but when you actually do, it has a certain logic to it. <laughs> so um, let's, let's dig in. So data protection, um, where should we start? Um, what, what are aspects on data protection that- So first, maybe first it's, uh, I would suggest to start by explaining what is the goal of data protection laws. Yeah. So, um, because what is protected is uh, is privacy, is the private and family life of a person, and by misusing uh, personal data, there is a risk of um, infringing private life, privacy of the person. That's why laws regulate on uh, how to use personal data. So, laws are about how to correctly use personal data in order not to infringe privacy, not to infringe private life of the person. Mm -hmm. um, because so personal data are the instruments, are the, the, the concrete instruments through which it is possible to, to um, invade it, to infringe uh, the private sphere. Um, so it's always about balancing, again, as you said, it's always about balancing several interests that are in conflict with each other. So on one side, for certain services, for certain reasons, there is a need of uh, processing personal data. But on the other side, there is uh, a respect of the private life of the person. So it's always about finding the good balance, uh, the fair balance between um, these two interests. And it's very difficult sometimes. Mm -hmm. So before nowadays regulations, um, 
we didn't we were not really aware of how much big data especially um, were or how much how much was the risk for processing big data in uh, infringing the privacy infringing private sphere um, so nowadays these laws regulate okay if you have a reason, if you need to um, to process personal data, for example, now outside of research field, if you need to buy, um, if you need to fly with an airplane, you need to book uh, a, a flight. Of course, there are organizational matters to organize the flight. You you must give your your name, surname, and certain personal data in order for the company to organize the flight, mm -hmm. because it's not like it's not as a bus you just enter in and you go where you need to go there is a whole organization so in order to give this service you need to provide personal data and the company has to to store to to process your personal data for the service mm -hmm. of the flight but then keeping these personal data and using them for advertising uh or for other things that's already that goes beyond what was the service what was the purpose for which you granted you released your personal data therefore that's an infringement of your private life because not because of the emails um, directly but because of your personal data being stored somewhere and being processed by someone without your knowledge maybe without your consent so um I, there are some can I at this point can I be devil's advocate for a second um, and as a naive question so what's the worst thing that could happen and because like in Germany we like when I follow the debates about um, data protection personal data privacy most people are saying well I have nothing to hide let them use my data of course yeah you think what, what does um, why is Google interested in uh, uh, in, in, in my life, I have nothing to hide, of course. Um, okay, but on the other side, who knows? You don't, we have no idea who, who is behind uh, processing personal data. So maybe um, at a certain point, so first to say in internet and with this big data, it's so easy to, um, to combine data sets and you never know one certain data set, how can be combined how how it can be matched with another data set or in in whose hands it can mm. end up and what can a certain person do with your data so the worst case scenario could be uh, there is a leak of uh, of data and someone in the world uses personal data for criminal um, infringements for criminal um behaviors such as uh creating false profiles and um taking data to to, to do some frauds or to um, to mislead someone by uh, in order to to do certain frauds that there are so many mm. to convince someone to, to receive money for example uh so if i have certain personal data of someone i can say that's a very easy example, but some, unfortunately it happens. Um, I, 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 I falsely say like, I'm your, I'm a member of your family. I need, I urgently need money. And I convince maybe uh, a naive person, an old person by telling, uh, but by knowing certain details of the family. So the person really very easily falls in the, like it's funny that you mentioned that because that actually happened just a week ago to my mother and yep. then when she shared that that it's like we we found that it was not the first time somebody yep. had used her number sending her a message as if it was from me or i mean yeah the gender didn't matter at that point but she received a message from an unknown number Oh, mom, imagine I lost, um, you don't know what happened. I had to get a new number and I need money. Please send it to this account. Exactly, which it, it could happen. I mean, and my it, mom it is really not naive. And still she yeah. thought like, I mean, her immediate reaction would have probably been to, to follow through. But then yeah. like, her husband was like, well, 
can you like let's try her number the the number that yeah, yeah exactly but good <laughs> okay obviously but like it's... Yeah, maybe also another a very simple uh, mm -hmm. example is uh, you publish on your facebook or on your instagram account some holiday pictures no mm -hmm. and you don't really reflect on how many data with this you're going to tell to the okay probably to your friends but depending on on, on the um, settings you have done on the social media maybe also to an, to a vaster audience no so mm -hmm. first of all you say currently i'm not at home no so um, this might mm -hmm. be useful information for someone who is interested in getting into your house no so, and also have or you, you tell people where exactly you are staying you tell people what kind of maybe hotels you're uh, staying in so you're I don't know, maybe five star hotel might tell people, okay, you are uh, of a, you, you can afford this kind of, of hotels. I don't know. So, but just by sometimes we are not aware of how much information we actually disclose through images or through some very simple uh, data yeah. uh, sharing. No? And then the geolocation is also transferred from the picture because on mobile phones, also smartphones, also smart, they also add the geolocation to the image information, the metadata of the actual photo. And then you post it on Facebook and then Facebook knows this information, but also anybody who's on Facebook can extract information from the image, right? So exactly. There are so many information with one only picture. One only picture can tell you um, or can tell who is behind a device who is in internet can tell so many information also if you think of your our contact list in our phone we can see uh, the prefix or we the, someone seeing the contact list can imagine with what countries we are in contact um, that can lead to many many information mm -hmm which are even maybe not really true. So it can really mislead certain judgments very, very easily. And without thinking of the worst case scenario, such as um, criminal uh, field, also big data, I, I think, well, again, some these big companies, they are, why are they interested in my very simple life? But if we um, multiply this with uh, by so many people, um, these big companies have uh, data about. It's really a huge amount of data, and they um, they gain so much money with this big amount of data. With this mm. big data, we only we use these services, these uh, social medias, uh, for free, mm. and we even we, di we we share our emotions through these social social medias. And who is responsible of this social media? They, 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 they have a profit of that. Yeah. And then the other fear or threat might be, which was discussed extensively here in Germany, is that personal data might be misused also by health insurances. If they yeah. see from the data that we so easily share on social media that we have whatever health conditions and then that might lead for us not getting insurance and therefore not being able to afford any treatments exactly, like yeah. that can actually be life-threatening sooner or later and this is already in a pretty safe environment where we think we're pretty safe in central europe but um when it comes to countries or fragile states like the the information sharing can actually lead to political persecution and exactly and discrimination and yeah yeah um so just to to make a loop from the personal use and sharing of our data to how that applies in a research context because in research with with fair data and open data and to make research data relevant in the first place and reusable and reproducible, we want to add as much information as possible. But yeah. what we just discussed, what's true for personal data sharing, there's also threats and limitations and consideration in research data, where we should, as, as researchers, should be highly cautious what is information that we need to add to contextualize the experiment and what is information that potentially puts the the research subjects or people that we work with, like patients and medical research often, 
all animal species that are being observed and are endangered by extinction uh, or from extinction might be at risk from poaching if we disclose their geolocation. So have you have you had are these questions that that come to you often? Kind of how to make an informed decision, what information to add as metadata to a data set and whatnot. Yeah, so it's um, brings all data protection laws uh, foresee some certain principles, which are, first of all, uh, if you process personal data, you need to inform the subject about what personal data you are processing, for what purpose, where are you storing personal data, um, etc. Mm -hmm. And consent is required. So the consent must be an informed consent. That means the person must be clearly informed of how their personal data are processed. Um, just to say maybe before a few years ago, our privacy policies were really unclear and very long and it was very hard to understand. No one would read privacy policies. Nowadays, with our uh, newest uh, data protection laws, it is required that privacy policies are all, must be clear so that the subject can read it through and can really understand or pretty much understand how personal data are used. And then after being informed, give uh, clear consent. So it is important when dealing with personal data also in research to have uh, an informed consent of the subjects and always uh, keeping into mind this balance between on one side need freedom of research which also requires a certain processing of personal data mm. um, and also to, to disclose the research and sometimes it's very difficult to fully anonymize uh, research data but on the other side always keep in mind not to violate privacy uh, of the the subject mm. or the subjects so it's always keeping this balance and um yeah so would you also, would you say this is my take from what you said like it lays on the responsibility of the researcher and research team to make a differentiation and have clear understanding of potential misuse cases of what they share? Exactly, yes, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. so first of all, when does uh, data protection law um, come into play? It's when you deal, as soon as you deal with personal data, that means a person is identifiable, then you need to apply, uh, well, mm -hmm then data protection laws apply and you need to consider all the, uh, the principles and all the rules. So not, it's not enough to remove the name and surname of the person, but you need to consider, and that has to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. um, if the per someone reads through the, the, the research data or sees the research data, is it possible to anyhow identify the person or not? If it is possible, maybe also through later on, through a matching with another data set, it is possible to mm -hmm. identify the subjects, then be careful. Uh, consent is required and um, minimum personal data must be uh, published, not what is not needed for the purpose of the research. Um, if you don't even deal with personal data, maybe there are some raw data or certain information about uh, certain facts and it's not, po it's not even about people or it's not possible to identify a specific person, mm -hmm. then there is no need, uh, then the data protection laws don't apply. Mm -hmm. Um, anonymization is very difficult. Uh, if you have a bunch of uh, personal data, maybe you have aggregated data and it's not, poss not possible to identify specific people, then that's good. That's, uh, again, personal data don't apply. Mm -hmm. But you, need, you really need to evaluate that specific case. Even if you have aggregated data, maybe 
there is a, there are a few data that can be related to uh, an identifiable person. Remove these few data and keep only the aggregated data. Mm. If you don't have consent, of course. If maybe there are certain people who are also happy to be heard, they are happy to, uh, to 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 give their voice about a certain problem, and they are also happy to be again with respect of their privacy, they are happy to be part of a research and be part of finding a certain solution to a problem. Of course, their consent is very important. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Um, and when we now consider to license the data for reuse also, mm -hmm. and to protect the data sets from misuse, yep. so I think both applies, right? Because why we want to add a license. Um, is it that like research data is where it's like I should, I feel I should know better at this point, but now with data sets, it's not as easy as with copyright and like the data sets is a different category as compared to images and anything creative and text. Um, because I think by default data is a public good, but you can protect it. Is that so? So there is no ownership of data. There is it's data. We cannot say they are private, they are public. They are who is the owner. Mm -hmm. um, there is no ownership as we know ownership as we mean it um, for like being a, a, an owner of a book, of a computer, of a mobile phone. Mm -hmm. um, it's there are these several rules, the several laws that apply. So data are about a person if there is an identifiable person and you need to respect their privacy. It's not about ownership, it's about paying attention of not violating the privacy of the subjects, um, the data I related to. Another thing is ownership in the meaning of copyright. So who is the right holder of the data if the data is protected by copyright? So mm -hmm. as you said, copyright protects um, artistic creations, maybe a data, it is possible that a data is not protected by copyright if there is no originality, if, there, if it's not a work, an artistic work. In that case, if a data, for example, a list of natural facts, maybe it's not even protected by copyright, it doesn't concern people, there is no privacy protection, there is no copyright protection that apply, so there is no ownership in that sense. Mm -hmm. And is it even there are discussions about yeah. there are discussions about recognizing a certain kind of mm, ownership, a certain kind of protection. But nowadays, there is no protection apart from copyright, and apart from uh, well, privacy. It's about protecting the person, not the data itself. It's also because many data repositories only have CC0 as an option to choose from as a license, which is yeah. because data is meant to be a public good to be reused mm -hmm. by other researchers in the research yes. context. Um, to, yeah. But then the researchers often feel protective about it because they put so much work into it. It's basically their whole exactly. brain yeah. so process. Just be careful not to confuse licenses and creative commons licenses are about, they regulate copyright matters, not mm. other matters, okay? Yeah. So if we release a content, if we release a data with a creative commons license, we only say, according to copyright rules, you are allowed, if, for example, with a CC0 license, you are allowed to reuse this content, you are allowed to modify, to share, mm. etc. Um, but it's about copyright. When you release a data under a CC0 license, you yourself, as a researcher, as the person who releases the content, are responsible that privacy matters are okay. Um, mm -hmm. And also other matters, there may be also certain um, commercial secrets that you need to consider in case. Uh, you also need to consider if there is a criminal law mm, mm. to consider, etc. So 
a Creative Commons license is only about copyright. There is right now a, a very big uh, issue because of certain big, big commercial companies used images uh, released in, I don't remember if it was um, um, in, in, in certain platforms under a CC0 license. So anyone is allowed to reuse these images and these mm -hmm. big commercial companies use these images also with faces and they use these images for um, artificial intelli intelligence recognition to, mm -hmm. to, um, to educate artificial in intelligence recognition. Mm -hmm. So right now there is a very big controversy or discussions about um, more ethical matters about is it okay that big commercial companies use CC0 images uh, to educate artificial intelligence mm -hmm. recognition? And it's difficult to give an answer because based on law, uh, if there is a concept, if the person that is captured in the image gave their consent for their image to be uploaded online and to be released under CC0 license. Um, that means also the right holder of the image granted the right to reuse the image for any purpose. That is what is granted in a CC0 license. The, there is no law mm, infringement. Mm. It's more about, but there is a problem. Some people are um, disturbed of the fact of their face being reused for uh, AI recognition. Mm. So it's, it's more about ethical problems and finding a solution to, yes, to release, to do the, when releasing uh, research data with a Creative Commons license, um, again, it's about copyright and you need consent, uh, you need a separate specific consent from the people subject of the uh, personal data mm. to permit anyone else to reuse such data, including yeah. personal data. Whereas if the research data are anonymized, they, they, then it is not possible to identify a person. There is no privacy matter. It, mm. There is maybe only copyright matter if it is a, a work protected by copyright. Okay. Yeah, maybe Susanna, um, I was just, you, you had this, Joe. You had this question about the the, the ownership of, of mm. data. No, and we said there in, in data protection we don't have this this concept, but um, we have this concept of again in copyright. No, it, it, it is it can be protected if it is considered as a work. So I don't know. I mean, this this again goes into copyright. Maybe we can discuss it. Mm -hmm. um, later on when we talk about copyright, but mm -hmm. also here, um, Susanna, please correct me. Um, we have to distinguish what kind of data can actually be uh, protected by copyright and can be considered a work. So a single data. So there, there, need, there are some characteristics, which uh, Susanna will, will explain uh, later on, mm -hmm. that uh, a work has to satisfy in order to be protected. No? And in some cases, data, or especially data sets. No? So how data are put together, there is some creativity in this. So mm -hmm. this might be a way to actually, um, uh, yeah, the, the work the researcher puts in this. Now you said the researcher actually feel that, no, this is my data. I created it. I put a lot of effort inside it. No? So uh, especially the way they compose their data sets, the, if there is some creativity, these data sets might be protected by copyright. No? But yeah, I, I leave maybe you can explain uh, better, Susanna. Well, I suggest we keep uh, copyright um, details and also there is an European directive that protects a data set. Um, we leave that for the copyright chapter, not to confuse it with mm -hmm. privacy um, rules, which are really independent one from the other. Mm -hmm. So it was just to say that um, it is important not to confuse when we release the research data under a Creative Commons license, we grant permission according to copyright rules, not according to privacy. It is implicit 
that when I release a data set under a Creative Commons uh, license, I already took care of privacy um, event potential problems. Mm -hmm. So when I release a, a research data under Creative Commons license, I already have consents, all the consents if they are needed. I already paid attention, I already evaluated that the data set maybe is not, doesn't include personal data. Mm. So I don't even need to apply um, data protection rules. If either I have consents, either I'm not dealing with personal data, I can release uh, the research data under a Creative Commons license, again, which regulates copyright matters. We will talk about that later. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, the question of data ownership is I, like, I often raise the question in my courses where I ask the students, so who do you think owns your data? And like, I like leading towards, okay, publish the heck out of your research, whatever you can, because you will lose access to your own research data. And like, assuming it's your own, it's probably not your own because look in your, in your work contract or in your whatever work agreement you have with institution, the university or the um, research institution where you work at, they might say there that whatever you generate as data and research output is theirs or not. And you may or may not be allowed and authorized to take your research output with you, but then you have to physically make sure to also do that. <laughs> um, and then also, with, depending on if you're a STEM researcher, depending on the equipment, maybe the equipment manufacturers also have a stake because it's only due to their manufacturing that you're able to generate certain kinds of data. Or your funder, maybe the funder says the data is ours because we give the money or the, and the funder can well be the taxpayer. So you better release the data because they pay for it. Um, so these are all also very much ethical questions or actual legal questions to consider because there might there are legal be questions, policies yes. in place that the researchers are often not aware of. Yep. I'm so on issue. Yes, I totally agree. There are both ethical but also legal uh, questions. Uh, it's true very often the researcher is not aware of their rights, is not aware of, of what is written inside a license um but again that's how a data can be used every it's all about copyright matter so i would oh, okay. really keep it for okay. later not yeah, to no confuse it with privacy about just to um what we can talk about ownership and data protection mm. is that again there is no ownership of our personal data i'm not the owner of my personal data so if what? I release personal data, wait, 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 I have to digest it for a second. Like, I don't own <laughs> my own personal data. That's new. <laughs> no, I'm not owner of my personal data. Mm, parents are not the owners of their children's personal data. Um, oh. There is no ownership of personal data. Huh. First of all, uh, cop data protection laws apply when processing personal data and the term processing means everything it means from the moment someone collects personal data the moment the person is doing something with personal it could be the process of pseudonymization of anonymization this changing this working with personal data mm. go within the term processing storing um and then deleting personal data, everything enter, is included in the, in the term of processing. So the laws, data protection laws say that these, all these rules apply when processing personal data. So first of all, keep in mind from the moment you are collecting, you mm. need to apply uh, or the, the processor need to apply uh, data protection rules. Mm. So the moment I release my personal data to maybe for, for example, a researcher who is doing uh, a survey, I'm releasing my personal data. Um, the researcher is processing my personal data. Mm. And it's not about giving 
or it's not about stealing personal data. It's just about processing. It's just about dealing mm. with personal data yeah. and automatically applying all data protection rules, which are uh, most important. It's uh, security me taking security measures about so to uh, avoid uh, leak of personal data, etc. So I, I, if I'm the subject of my personal data, I have a control. Data protection laws guarantee the subjects, they have a control over their personal data. What does that mean? It's the possibility of knowing, or it's the right to know who is processing my personal data, who is doing what with my personal data, and controlling where are my personal data stored. That means I also have the right to ask, please delete all my personal data. Yeah. And um, so these are all the rules, all the rights that are within data protection laws in this control. So it's not about ownership, but it's about controlling what, who is doing with my personal data. Okay, that's actually interesting. I hope that's yeah. a little bit more clear. A little bit. <laughs> but so <laughs> I, I need to wrap my head around, but it's I'm getting there. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I wanted to briefly because this is actually a hard a hard mm -hmm. topic for me. Um, the care principles. I don't know if you're familiar with them. The, and I'm not sure if that well. Uh, like after what I learned from you today already is I'm not sure if that even applies to data protection or if it's again, I think it's more of a copyright, but I would like to mention it here so that for the copyright edition of our conversation, we can maybe yeah. refer back to it. So the the care principles are meant to complement the fair principles, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusability of research data, which yeah. I think is also more... I assume it's also getting more copyright related. Yes, it is. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So well, privacy are also are included, but it's not about. Um, it is indirectly yeah. uh, related. But yeah. Okay. To privacy. Um, and now the care principles were postulated by indigenous community representatives who also happen to be researchers. And being well aware of the fair principles and appreciating these, they figured well when it comes to working with local um, or and additional indigenous um, communities, all the ethical questions are not being addressed and answered. Like many of which we had in our conversation, as in the Western context, so to say. But um, there is no such thing as individual ownership of anything. So copyright again. I think we'll have that more um in depth in the next um episode yeah but just to mention like the care principles look towards collective benefit of the research data authority to control responsibility and ethics mm -hmm. and again like some of which we also addressed here in the data protection um section session yeah <laughs> and would you like to add a few comments on this or should we have that later um just to maybe to conclude to 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 finish this uh, data protection chapter, it's <laughs> on a theoretical level data protection is very easy mm. uh, because it's really about first of all wonder are you dealing with personal data or not? Mm. If not, very well, <laughs> you are um, avoiding many potential problems. Mm. Um, in that case, we could be either your data are about maybe natural effects or, for example, arts paintings. So there are, apart from the authors of paintings of the arts, there are no personal data and that's okay. Or you deal with aggregated data. So mm -hmm. fully anonymized. It is not, it is absolutely not possible to identify the subjects. Mm -hmm. On the other side, if you, if yes, you deal with personal data, um, consent is required. There, are, there here in Switzerland, we have an exception which permits uh, processing personal data for research purposes, but it's really a very restrictive exception. So it's 
it's better to always have a constant uh, of the subjects in order to use their personal data for, uh, for the research. One thing is using data for the research, for example, doing surveys. And another thing, uh, another specific constant is required to publish the personal data. It is possible a researcher uh, collects personal data, but then in the phase, in the moment of publishing, uh, it is possible for the researcher to publish on the anonymized mm, research results. Mm -hmm. So there are these several steps, and in each step, uh, uh, the researcher needs to wonder if he's dealing, he's still dealing with personal data and specific consent is required. Mm -hmm. And that applies, so this rule applies to any kind of pro processing personal data. It's always about, am I, either I'm a researcher, uh, I want to publish my research results uh, within the institutional platform with closed access, uh, if I publish my research results with open access, uh, it doesn't matter. Always apply these rules. Okay. Okay. So it's on a theoretical level, there is not a lot to talk about. I don't want to, um, to minimize the problem, the, the, the subject, but it's really about a theoretical level. The, the rules to apply are very hmm. easy. There are only a few of them. But it gets very complex as we also found in our conversation here today when we look at a specific research project and then to identify which are the data points that actually contain personal data and to what extent and how far do we need to anonymize it to still be explicit in what, what we want to say with our data uh, to yeah. towards the results of the project um, at the same time protecting individuals for their yeah. personal identities. Yeah, so it's really on a case by case basis um, to evaluate what is the solution to find this balance between the interest, one side, the, the research interest in publishing uh, either the data set or the research results or the research itself, the publication, and on the other side, the interest of the subject um, of respecting their privacy. Mm -hmm. So, of course, if we think of a health research, uh, psychiatry research, it's very difficult maybe to, to anonymize a data set of survey or mm -hmm. certain results. Um, it would also maybe not make sense to publish a research by, anonymi by completely anonymizing, because maybe you are talking about only a few cases that happened in the world. Mm -hmm. So maybe uh, someone in this living in the same city of the subject, if it happens that this person uh, reads the, um, the, the research or the content, the data, is able to identify the subject because it's only, it's one in a million. Yeah. So in such cases, it's really very, very difficult to to anonymize and to respect privacy. Either you don't publish mm. um, the research or, yeah, so it's it's really on a case by case basis to, mm. to, to find this fair balance between these interests. Yeah, but thankfully there's also now tools available to anonymize data sets semi-automatically. I mean, there's still a human factor that's necessary. Um, yeah. We also add these to the links, but okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for enlightening us on data protection. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think the topic com remains complex. Agrees. <laughs> mm, well, very much complex. <laughs> but I feel also like it really help for you to explain the different aspects that come to play and the considerations um, that are necessary to have and to discuss on the research team.